For our lesson this morning, we're going to look at a passage from Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And, and I, I, I really appreciate Danny's prayer where he talks about, yeah, we've been over this a hundred times maybe, but every now and then you look at it and you get a little bit of a different slant or a little bit of a different take that gives it a little better meaning. And I hope that's true for you today because it is for me, it, it, as I study it and look at it, in fact, uh, I thought of some things overnight that this morning I got up and, and had to redo some of the, the PowerPoint uh, for things that I want to say, points that I want to make that, that, that really stand out here with what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He writes here that he, and that's God, and, and when we say God, we can be talking about God the Father, but more than likely we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as as the, the three beings of the Godhead, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I want to talk about salvation and what, what salvation, not totally the process of it, but, but what salvation really is or the beginnings of it and, and how it really comes to us. I want to call your attention to the word delivered. Delivered. And when we look at it, I, I don't know if we're reading that passage and we're just, you know, reading over, passing through it and all that we understand. And, you know, one of the usages of the word <coughs> delivered is like when a woman has a baby. And the baby is delivered. And, and someone... Well, the usage is to assist in the birth of. And you might hear a person say, the doctor showed up just in time to deliver the baby. Well, he delivered it. It was coming anyway, but, but he, he delivered it. Or the you know, she delivered a seven-pound baby boy or whatever. So think of that in those terms because the Bible speaks of our initial salvation. And please, understand that we have an initial salvation and we have a continuing salvation. We have a salvation where we come to the point where we're saved, but then we have a continuing salvation in what the Apostle Paul and many other of the Bible writers talk about as being saved. We are being saved. And if you're a Christian this morning, you're being saved until the time of death and then judgment comes and when we enter into heaven then we are eternally saved. Now it, it's a process that, that we go through but we're talking about the initial part of salvation and that's always presented as a new birth. We've got to be born again. You were born again into the kingdom of God. You were born again born again. So Paul, as Paul uses this word, it, it, it takes on a new essence, I hope, for us to understand. It's like he's there to deliver us. And then he's there to transfer us. And we'll talk about transfer in just a little while. But what I want to do is look at this, that he delivers us into salvation. And we'll look at four things in this passage that the Apostle Paul says that God has done for us in Christ. What the deity has done for us in Christ. Now, yeah, Christ is deity, but, but you, you want to separate the two. You want to keep it separate. God the Father, God the Son, God the Word, and then Christ in his position as our Savior. So first of all, he says God has delivered us from the power, from the domain of darkness. Some translations say power of darkness, but it's the domain of darkness. And, and another good uh, passage that I didn't put in here that I just thought of is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, say that uh, uh, having been saved by grace, see, we uh, uh, enter into this state of grace we're free from the wrath of God. He's delivered us from the wrath. And 
now we stand in a state of grace. Now that's not a just a literal uh, rendering of that uh, Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. Having been justified by faith, we stand in grace, not the wrath of God. Physical darkness is a serious matter for the human race, is it not? Darkness, get up in the middle of the night in a strange room in the dark to go to the bathroom or do whatever and you run into something and you stub your toe, or you bang your shin or twist a knee, whatever. But, but there are more things out there in the dark that we look at. So what, what do people do? What do we do? We spend a lot of money to light things up, don't we? We pay taxes for street lights, or maybe if you don't live in town, you, you have a security light at your place, you know, and you pay for it. Why? Because you, you want things lit up. You want it to so be able to see if there's any danger out there. Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reverse the effect of darkness. Because what does darkness do to us? And we talked about it last week, didn't we, Charlie? produces fear, fear, uh, uh, things are creeping around out there, and there are noises and there are things, and in the dark you can't see them, and, and, and you, you get afraid of some things, so you're very careful, so you light it up, so that you can see that there's nothing there to be afraid of, but when darkness is in control, Panic has the ability to control our lives, to take over our very being. So we want to be in the light. It would be great if everyone was aware of spiritual darkness. In the same way that we are of physical darkness. Because there's a spiritual darkness where God is not. There's spiritual darkness. And so, well, wait a minute. God is everywhere. God has the capability of being everywhere. But that doesn't mean that God is everywhere. There's some places that God won't go. There's some places where God is not invited. God doesn't go where he's not invited unless he's on a rescue mission. And that's a whole different story. But, but there, there are places where God says we shouldn't go. Things that we shouldn't be doing. So uh, we've got to be careful of the spiritual darkness and what we want to do is light up our world, light up our spirit to the point where we can see the darkness. And then the darkness doesn't control us. The darkness doesn't call, cause fear in us to the point where well, we try to do things in worldly ways to alleviate the fear instead of just trusting in God that he'll take care of us. A person walking outside the light of truth has no chance of spiritual success. But well, what's spiritual success? Well, it's getting out of this world alive, isn't it? it? It's getting to heaven when this life is over, not to suffer eternal death. But, but see, if we're walking outside of the light, we have no hope. So we've got to walk in the light. Spiritual darkness leaves us hopeless and happy. Helpless. Hopeless and helpless. Because we can't see where the hope is. We can't see where the help is. But if we concentrate, if we look, and especially if we'll open God's Word, we'll get a little glimpse of that light. We we'll get a little glimpse of it, and then if we kind of concentrate, and work toward that by believing in God and trusting in God and moving toward Him, you know, the light gets greater. Did you ever notice that? Uh, you can be miles, well, I tell you, when, when we first moved to, to western Oklahoma, uh, about a mile outside of Elk City, Oklahoma, we could see the blinker lights at the intersection uh, there's a four-way stop there between Sayre and Cheyenne, uh, and it's between Elk City and, and Sweetwater, too. And I think it's about 12 miles away. So I see that blinker light, and I said, oh, right, right up there is the next intersection. We just drove, and we drove, and we drove. <laughs> and 
and it was at night, so we could see that light. And finally got there. It's a long way. So you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you've been through it yourself, too. But when we got there, uh, there it is. But see, far off, what is it? Think in terms of Moses when he's out in the wilderness. He sees a burning bush out in the, in, in the, in the, in the desert. That happens all the time. Listen, it happens, what? Internal combustion, whatever, I, I don't know what it is, but a, a, a bush that's out there and it's dry and that heat will just whoosh, and that's it. it, it burns out. But the thing that he noticed was it keeps burning. And if he noticed it, there were other people that noticed it too. But you know, he was the only one that went to investigate it. He's the only one of all those people that went and said, wait a minute, that bush, it's still burning. It, it's bur How long? You know, it may have been an hour, two hours. It may have been. It was burning yesterday. But he finally goes to where the bush is, and, and that's how God could use him to do what he did to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Now you talk about darkness. There, there was darkness, and he led them to the same light that he was led to. So. We can be delivered from the frightening power of spiritual darkness. And, and this is what Jesus says even about himself. John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's an understanding there. There's an appreciation there for what God has done. But see, you've got to have that courage and that strength to follow that where he leads us because he isn't going to lead us anywhere that's that's bad the second thing we note is that God has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son and again I think if we just do a cursory reading and come down there he's delivered us from from darkness and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son we, we might miss some of the terminology that's here. What do you do when you buy a car, Charlie? I drive it. You drive it, but you got to get the <coughs> title oh, transferred, don't you? Why? Because you don't want to buy a car and not get the title. Because if you don't have title to it, somebody does. And they might come and say, hey, that's my car. I've got the title. I want my car. And you're out your money, and now you got, you're walking again. See? But we talk about that in, in, in legal terms. Uh, when it's real property, you get a title for it or a deed, a house, a farm, whatever, right? And the first thing you want to do is get that title or deed transferred into your name. Well. When God removes us from the kingdom of spiritual darkness, Christ, what does he do? He transfers title to his son. He transfers title over us to his son, Jesus Christ, who is our king. You know, a king owns everything in the country, doesn't he? That's the point of it. He owns everything, so uh, he owns everybody, and he owns the property that they were and all. It's typically how it works. So he transfers title to us to a new owner. And that's Jesus Christ. Because he has bought us. And we'll talk about that in a moment. How, how that process works. But he bought us. He bought us out of spiritual darkness. He bought us from some place that we couldn't buy ourselves out of. There's not, no amount of money we could pay. Nothing we could give. We couldn't even give our lives. Say, so God, I'll just kill myself so that my sins will be forgiven. Well, no, that, that would just be uh, another sin added on to it because we can't even be our own sacrifice for sin. We have to rely upon somebody else, and that's Jesus Christ. So if we remember this point, that we're transferred. He owns us. So I've got a new set of a new way of looking at things. I have to have. That I've got to obey the one who owns me. If not, I'm in rebellion. Well, wait a minute. 
wasn't I in rebellion before when I was walking in darkness? That's true. But see, if we disobey God, if we disobey Christ, our King, then we're in rebellion to Him still, and we might be headed back to darkness. Second Peter chapter two, like what is it, verses like 18, 19, and 20 talk about you know the, the dog that returns to its vomit. Oh, what an ugly thought. And the, the, the sow that's washed returns to the mud. Those aren't pretty things, are they? But but see, we can be in Christ and yet be in rebellion to him. So we've got to be careful to keep our allegiance to him correct. You know why we go like this to pray? This is an end of my lesson. You know why we go like this to pray? Because in the old time, what the people would do, the commoners would come up and they would go like this. And when they would go like this, the king would put his hands over theirs. And, and that was a sign that they were giving allegiance to the king. And the king was saying, yes, you're my person. You belong to me. We're in a right relationship. That's why we, you know, commonly today, this is the way people understand about praying. Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. And Paul, talking to the Christians, the church at Corinth, says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. If Christ owns my body, he has the right to say what I should do with my body. And sometimes I get in rebellion to him. And that's bad, because now I'm headed back to spiritual darkness. I've got to get corrected, because if I don't, then... It's going to be, I'll be lost again. Now, that's something to, to look at for a later time about coming back from that state. But also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Don't become slaves of men. And this is, religiously you think of this. How many people are there out in this world who believe themselves to be Christians, to be following God, that all they know is what their preacher tells them? Or what their denomination tells them? They don't study for themselves to learn anything about what it means to be free in Christ. We're not supposed to be slaves to men in any way. And, you know, we have the right to say no to men. There are, there are limits to where is it? No, you, you just can't do that because we've got to be loyal to Christ. Now, the great thing is that we can be a part of this kingdom right now. Right now. It, but it's, look, it's not like we have to go to heaven to be a part of the kingdom. We would be a king, part of the kingdom here on earth, but it's even deeper than that. Listen, the reign of Christ isn't in an earthly palace. It's in the heart's of the delivered and transferred followers of Christ right now. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 20, 17, verse 21. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, talking about the kingdom. Behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's in the midst of us. But listen, it's in each and every one of us. The kingdom of God is there. Why? Because the light is within. The Holy Spirit is there within. So it's not, you know, I owe my allegiance to Rome. Or I owe my allegiance to some place in England or Scotland or to some place out in Salt Lake City or whatever. No, my allegiance is in heaven because that's where my citizenship is. So we see this, you know, God... God has delivered us like a doctor delivering a baby. He's delivered us and transferred ownership of us into his beloved son and into the kingdom of his beloved son. But how does he do that? It's because God has given us redemption. Again, it's impossible for us to pay our sin debt. Now, redemption relates to the purchasing of the freedom of persons in slavery. 
that, that's the total meaning of it. We miss it because we, we really don't live in a culture where there's slavery. But if you were a slave, you could be redeemed. The way you're redeemed is you pay so much money to your master and he would give you your freedom. But if you're a slave and all you're getting is what you can eat and, and a roof over your head and clothes on your back, how in the world can you per you know, save up money, if you're not getting any, to purchase your freedom. Well, that's where if you have a rich relative, or relatives, you know, that can pull money together, they could buy your freedom, and the slave would set you free, or the master would set you free. See, we couldn't do it. It's impossible. So without a Savior, we, were, we are doomed. Christ has paid the price for us redeeming us from the slavery of sin, or from sin, or of sin. Now, look, here we are in this kingdom of darkness. It's because of sin. And Christ over here has paid the price. His blood is over here. So we have to be delivered from here and transferred over here where His blood will cleanse us of our sins and we can be forgiven. Now do you see that picture coming together in such a perfect way? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Grace because we couldn't pay for it, we couldn't earn it, there's nothing we could do except say, God be merciful unto me, a sinner, and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He took a taste of death, even though he's God, God in the flesh. And God doesn't die. But he became a human being so he could taste that death to understand what we were going through, offer himself and say, hey, if you will trust in me and obey me, obey the gospel over here, I will redeem you. I'll, I'll purchase you. And the price is my blood. And, and the fourth thing. God gives us forgiveness of sins. That's related to the third thing, but it's also related to the first two. Living in the dark realm of sin is, sin is living without God in our lives. Uh, Jesus said to uh, some people that were complaining about him, he said, you are children of your father, the devil. Oh boy, they didn't like that. Now, what, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, we come upon this thing. Now, I remember there's a song that said, With God as our Father, brothers all are we. And that's true, but what they're trying to do is make a universal statement about humanity. Listen, there are people out here who are the children of God. There are people out here who are the children of the devil. But it's where they're walking. Are they walking in the kingdom of darkness or are they walking in the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear Son? If they're walking in the kingdom of darkness, they're the children of the devil. Now, I'm not the one who come up with that. That's what the Bible teaches. God turns away from us when we walk in darkness. The Bible says that. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. We've got to be willing to part with those sins. We've got to give them up. In fact, the, the, the term remission or forgiveness there is like put away. And it's like a divorce. In the Bible, when it talks about the divorce, what does it say? If a man puts away his wife, okay? So we have to divorce ourselves or 
put away sin out of our lives. Because we can't have both God and sin. Because one's going to control us. One's going to be the master over us. And we don't want sin to master us. The great news is that God will gladly <coughs> renew his relationship with us if we allow him. And that's what the new birth is about. It's a submission. It's not something we do, it's something we submit to. To have forgiveness, our sins must be cleansed by the blood of Christ, but that's over here. That's outside of the domain of darkness. It's over here after we've been delivered and transferred, and probably within the process itself. So we reach the blood of Christ when we obey the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. Do you not know that all of us, and Paul's talking to the church at Rome, so Christians, who all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, and that's what baptism represents, we shall certainly be united with him in, the resurrec in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer be, and there's those words, enslaved to sin. We've been redeemed. We're not slaves to sin. We are essentially slaves to Jesus Christ. So, two passages just to close this up. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Uh, was talking to him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We've got to be born again. We've got to be delivered from the domain of darkness, don't we? Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a, a second time to his mother's womb and be born? Now, it's not a physical thing. It's not the physical part of baptism that's important. It's the spiritual part of it, isn't it? I mean, we've got to do the physical thing, but it's the spiritual part that's important. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can't leave the domain kingdom of darkness or the domain of darkness to come over here into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we've got to be born of the water and the spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 41, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter and the rest of the apostles are preaching to the to the people who stood and said, Crucify Jesus. Crucify Him. And He's convinced them that Jesus is the Christ and they need to obey Him. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized, and were, there were added, and that's to the kingdom of God's dear Son, that day, about 3,000 souls. It's the same way it's done today. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Be transferred, be delivered and transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. That's where I want to be. I hope that's where you want to be and we want to reach everybody who would desire the same thing and show them what it takes, what it takes and what God is willing to do for us. Thank you so much for your time. If you have need this morning, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.